Welcome back to another episode of the Mountain West Insider Podcast here on the Field of 68 Media Network. My name is Rob Doster. I got Jeff Goodman with me. I'm going to be joined here in just a couple of minutes by J.D. Pollock. He is a former San Diego State assistant coach who is now uh, out of the coaching business, getting into the media space, and he is going to help me break down this UConn-San Diego State matchup because I think that San Diego State is a tougher matchup for UConn than a lot of people realize. Uh, so, Jeff, why don't we just start right there? San Diego State, Sweet 16, second straight year that they've advanced to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. I mean, what Dutch has done is is remarkable. And now obviously, it comes on the heels of what, uh, you know, what Steve Fisher did, but Dutch was a huge part of that. But to keep this thing going and keep it going at this level, and what people don't realize is they don't have crazy NIL. They don't have the crazy budget that a lot of the other teams that are right now still around in the Sweet 16 have. Um, so I think that makes it even more impressive. But, you know, listen, part of it is they've done a great job evaluating. They've done a great job getting uh, bounce back guys, uh, transfers, and developing guys, evaluating, developing. And that staff, man, that staff's about as good as any staff in America. They really are, top to bottom. And, um, uh, yeah, they listen. I'm not sure they beat UConn, but just the fact that they get a shot at UConn here, um, you know, you're playing with house money in a way. You're playing with house money right now. Yeah, there's to me, there's essentially three things you have to do to be able to beat this UConn team. And and for the Mountain West listeners, um, I grew up a UConn fan. I watch more UConn than probably anybody. Uh, I do a UConn podcast on uh, the Field of 68 Network, um, so I feel like I have a as good of a grasp on this team as anybody in media, I think there's three things that you need to do to be able to beat them. One is you got to get Donovan Klingon in foul trouble. He is as impactful as any player in college basketball on the defensive end of the floor. Uh, you have to be able to blow up with a run offensively. Um, you're going to be surprised when you watch them and just how intricate their offense is. Uh, it's it, it's kind of like last season, but it's, uh, it's, it's even more in-depth and more elaborate this year. Um, and the third thing you have to do is you have to catch fire from the perimeter. Like you have to have a uh, outlier performance on the offensive end, even more so if you're San Diego State. I think they can do those first two things pretty easily, right? I think that Jaden Ledee getting Donovan Klingon in foul trouble is um, one, what the first thing on the scattering report and game plan should be, and two, something that is quite doable considering that uh, Ledee, I think he he draws seven point four fouls per forty minutes. He's really good at drawing fouls. He's got to do it. Um, He's got to do it on Thursday. Two, I think they can take UConn out of what they want to run because they are big, they are physical, they are switchable, and they are a top 10 defense in America. They have the the pieces to be able to do that. It's easier said than done, but if you're going to do it, they are a team that's built to be able to do it. Now, all you got to do is you hope you have an outlier performance offensively. Um, if there is a knock on this team, it's that they are not great offensively. They can have long scoring droughts. Uh, and they are not a very good three-point shooting team. But you know what? Kansas isn't a very good three-point shooting team. And you know why they beat UConn? They went nine for 14 from three. So when you're going up against someone that's better than you, it's why they call the three-pointer the great equalizer, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, listen, they shot it so well in the last game, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that, that that's part of the reason they absolutely crushed Yale is, is they made shots. And, you know, again, sometimes you can get on that type of a, of a rhythm. And, you know, the culture of this program, we talk about the UConn culture. And, and really, it's only, it's only been like that for a year or two. San Diego State's culture has been like that for so long. Now it's be, been based on defense. And, you know, the one thing seeing them in person earlier this year that they could use, especially in this game, is a rim protector, a shot blocker, a Nathan Mensa type against Donovan Klingon. Uh, but it's not like Klingon is a big time scorer in the post, right? He's not. Um, I worry about, I just worry about Ledee having an off night. I always do. He doesn't have them, but if he has them, They've got a wing in a in a complete grinder, and I think UConn's just got too much firepower offensively to mm -hmm. be able to beat them in a grinder. Like you're just not, you're not. If they want to, they can control pe tempo, they can control pace. Uh, they've got a, a fifth year point guard um, who, who again has done it long enough that, and they're big, they're bigger at the wing spots. I, I don't know, man. Like, they, like I'm trying to, hey, I'm trying to talk myself into a way that San Diego State can. Pull a miracle here and, there's, and beat UConn. There's very few teams left in this tournament that are capable of actually beating the best team in college basketball this year. And um, San Diego State matches up well enough. I don't know if that means that they'll be able to get them on a night uh, when UConn is locked in on the other side of the country. All right, last thing I want to say, and, and I'll let you uh, kind of respond to it once, once you're done. 
Um, I don't agree with this this national narrative that the the Mountain West is um, had a disappointing tournament or is a fraudulent league because of the tournament that they had. All right, there's a couple things I don't want to get to here. One, uh, they have a team that is in the Sweet 16, and it is the only team that was ranked above the 8-9 game, or that was seated above the 8-9 game. That team has made it to the Sweet 16 in San Diego State. Uh, two, they went 3-5 and five in the tournament outside of that team that is currently in the, uh, in, um, the Sweet 16, right? And they did it despite having only one team that was, a, uh, that was ranked above a single-digit seed. Um, I would argue that uh, this is what happens when you have a bunch of teams in your conference that are under-seeded, like a Boise State, like a Colorado State, and like a Nevada. Um, and I get a little bit frustrated when uh, when people have this expectation that just because we all love the Mountain West and it was fun and there were a lot of really good teams, the fact that they are not as good as, let's just say, the top 12 teams in America and someone like a Nevada is not um, – is not, uh, you know, getting to the the second weekend or, uh, you know, Boise State is losing to a Texas team that's loaded with NBA guys. Like it just it's very frustrating to me that um, we're going to write a completely write off the Mountain West this season because Utah State got smacked by a Purdue team that has smacked a lot of people in college basketball uh, this season. So, um, yeah, I don't buy the narrative. I, I just yeah. don't buy the narrative because, again, um you know, you got six teams in. They had a great regular season. Anything could happen in the tournament. The ACC was very mediocre. You know, top heavy. Obviously, you saw Carolina, Duke, uh, Clemson's been good. But mm -hmm. you know, you see it. it. Just because NC State's in the Sweet Sixteen doesn't mean they're a really good team all year. Mm -hmm. You know, they had to win five games in five days just to get in the tournament. So I, I don't. It's a one and done tournament. It's different. It's not like you're playing four out of seven series. And, I think, and it's very yeah. like it's just to call it a disappointment because a ten seed loses in the first weekend of the tournament. Like that's what they're supposed to do. Ten seed isn't supposed to get to the second round, you know. So it's um, don't underseed teams from the Mountain West that are good, and then don't act like it's all that shocking with the, with a whole bunch of teams that we thought were like in that twenty five to thirty five range nationally. Like that's what we thought they were, right? We weren't saying that there were a bunch of top ten teams in America in the Mountain West. We said that there are like six or seven teams that are all like borderline top twenty five, which is really really good for a conference like this. Um, don't be shocked when you underseed them, and then they uh, they they do what a ten seed is supposed to do. So. Um, it is what it is. Eventually, one day, people will recognize the Mountain West as one of the best conferences in college basketball, and we will sit here and keep fighting for them until that day, Jeff. Until then, uh, I have J.D. Pollock on here. He's going to help me break down this UConn-San Diego State matchup, and I'm going to get him to try to talk me into how UConn ends up losing this game. That's coming up next. And now let me welcome onto the podcast, J.D. Pollock, who was a member of San Diego State's coaching staff last season, who is now doing some media work, and who knows this program and this team better than just about anybody else in this space. So, J.D., first and foremost, man, what's going on? How are we doing? Doing good. I'm doing good. I'm giddy over here. It's it's interesting not being in the tournament, but this is as good as it gets if you're not going to be there. So how has it been watching uh, a team that you support from the sideline as opposed to you know being someone in that locker room and on the bench? It's been interesting because with this team specifically, it'll change. You know how quick these rosters change. It'll be different even next season. But this season, those are still, you know, what we would all call like my guys. I was there uh, all the way up until school basically began. Um, supporting them has just been awesome because you can hear the conversations on the bench without being there. You can hear the, the locker room. I know as soon as they walk off what they're about to go talk about. And um as San Diego State plays, you can kind of feel the runs as they go and, and you kind of know the battles they're going through. Um, it's been really cool. It's been interesting because with it, without being on the bench, uh, you know what it takes to be on the bench. And that's that's why I kind of made my switch. But um, it's been awesome supporting them. And, and I'm proud of them. They believe me. They believe that they're not here on accident. So. What's the biggest difference between this year's group and, and last year's group beyond just like the, the obvious personnel changes? What, what's the difference in kind of how they play? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, the goal was to really, really not like the press conference interview. We're still San Diego state, but the goal was to play faster because we, we got rid of those, those seniors that led us for so long. And, and we knew we had to replace them kind of in a different way. And you're not just going to rinse and repeat that without those old heads there. 
And so it was like kind of a, a good time to, okay, let's up the tempo a little bit. And, and I think I still see spurts of it, even though all basketball slows down at the end of the year. I mean, from the college tournament, sometimes if you're not Alabama and Grand Canyon um, to even the NBA slows down in the playoffs. And so they'll value the ball and all that, but you still see them. They'll up in the head one time and just pull a corner three. And, and they didn't always do that. So I think they're still trying to take advantage of, of the defense when they're not set. Um, and then obviously just playing through Jaden. I mean, that's a personnel thing, but we didn't just live throwing it on the block last year, maybe a couple duck ins off of a drive where you jump, stop, pivot, throw it to a block or things like that. We didn't have the floor spaced with corners. And then now it's throw it inside all the time, you know, and, and Jaden's unselfish enough to, to finish obviously while still kicking it with double teams. He's, he's learning how to do that every game, but uh, definitely some new sets in to get it in definitely some new high, low stuff. Uh, kind of like Utah State used to run with Merrill and Kata to where they, they pin down and then throw it straight down from the top of the key. Um, all that stuff that was so hard to guard for us in the league for a couple of years there is Jaden may not be 7-1, but he's a beast down there. So you got to get it to him at some point. Yeah, the best coaches in America always make sure to steal the best stuff from the guys that beat them, right? That's uh, that's how you do it in this business. Um, are you – we'll talk about the matchup in a second, but I am curious. The, with Jaden's the, – the explosion he's had this season, right? Are you surprised to see – how good he has been uh i'll quote dutch a little bit because in the offices all last year with Keyshad, with ag and nate mm -hmm. mensa and all them i was i was standing on a table saying jane liddy's our best player he's our best player and because of his red shirt year with literally either walk-ons or sometimes even a manager that's you know on the roster he is kicking butt I mean he is they're winning some he's getting fouled just like he does and it was like it reminded me of when Malachi Flynn was redshirted and, and he'd carry the scout team and it was like what what are people gonna do with him and then last year we were I think our learning curve was real thin because it's like well we have the veterans ready to go we didn't really have time for Jaden to to get caught up to speed he hadn't played major game minutes because of those previous universities and then a red shirt year and he had built himself into the specimen and mentally he was ready to go. And, and when you'd give him five, seven minutes, sometimes he'd force it. Sometimes he wanted to produce so bad and he might uh, pull a quick one like he is now, but the confidence wasn't there. It's the same shot and he feels different or he might travel or he might shot fake and draw, not draw foul, but have tried to. And so he just wasn't quite smooth enough. And all the while we're like, well, we have, the three best defenders in the league right here we could just go rock solid and then let Jaden chip in while he can and he started to do more and more there towards the end of the year um with 13 against Bama and 12 I think on UConn or something like that and so it was coming and so Dutch has been saying all year he's like I'm just surprised it took this long honestly I mean I, I thought he was an 18 and 10 guy I did I thought he was going to start all last year he would he was ready but we were so old that it was just you're just part of it right now. You're not the team yet. So well, that is it's why you guys were able to make the final four and get to the national title games because when you have a kid as good as he is, accepting a role the way that he did, that's the idea, right? That's the dream. Look at what uh, UConn's doing right now with, with Donovan Klingon. You know, like right. he was the sixth man last year, and uh, everyone knew that if he wanted to play starter minutes somewhere else, he probably could have gone somewhere else to play starters minutes. But he accepted the role that he was asked to play, and he thrived in it. Yeah, absolutely. No, they, I mean, they they had they had starters not starting. And and that's kind of how we felt last year was Micah Parrish was a starter. He just wasn't starting. And we, we kind of had a, an offensive unit, which is kind of this year's team, even though they haven't been this offensive juggernaut. But last year they would come in and produce. And uh, and so we had starters not starting. And this year it's their team and, and they've carried the mail. They're doing really well. All right. Let's talk about uh, this this particular matchup. Um what I think there's basically three things you have to do to to beat this UConn team. The first one is find a way to get uh, the big fellow in foul trouble, right? Donovan Klingon. And I think that Jaden Ledee, I, I saw a stat, I want to say he averages almost eight fouls drawn per game, which seems like the kind of like role that you would want a guy to play if you're trying to get a big fellow in foul trouble. Uh, two, you got to be able defensively to blow up their sets. They're going to run all that intricate, elaborate action, right? And I think San Diego State is a team that is capable of doing that. And the third thing is you got to get hot from three. Like you can't, you got to be able to space them out. You got to be able to have an outlier offensive performance, which we saw from Kansas, 
which you saw from, uh, well, I don't know if it was necessary to outlet, but we saw about the, the top 1% of what Creighton can do uh, from beyond mm-hmm. the arc. Is San Diego State capable of all that? Because I do feel like this is, at least on paper, a pretty good matchup personnel-wise. Capable, yes. Um, I, I hope they didn't use up all the bullets last game. Um, people <laughs> around the country think what just happened, and 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 we know what happened because the lid came off and they all felt great. You know, I mean, and that's going to happen with teams every now and then. But I, Micah Parrish's first summer workout this year, after the the title run and and all the celebration stuff and all that, the very first time we got back in there. He started the workout 38 for 38 from three. And yeah, that's not bad. That shows you it's a it's a mentality. He's as tough as they come. Obviously, any baseball hitter goes in slumps and shooters go in slumps. It has nothing to do with what they're capable of. So if they found something last week and they can just tap into it, you don't have to hit 13 threes. I mean, San Diego State might because it's UConn. It's, but you didn't last to the glass game. But they can. They can shoot the ball. Darion Trammell was first team all league. He was MVP of the Final Four last year, or the, the region, to get to the Final Four. Lamont just runs the show. He's as steady as they come. He can raise up and stick to when needed. I think some of the X factors are Micah. I think it's Elijah Saunders. I think it's Darion trying to find a way. I just, I'd assume he draws uh, Cam Spencer. And, and then I assume that Newton is on Butler. Um I mean, that's, that's just high level play. And so it is, it's going to be about finding ways to produce and get some buckets. Um, one, one you mentioned there, it's, I've been talking with, with my little group about it with Jaden getting fouls is I think he's got to really find a way to do both. I think he's got to challenge him and make him actually defend him, but mm-hmm. I think he's got to do what he's doing and step out and hit his elbow jumper and hit one of those two, one or two catch and shoot threes from the top, at least to try and keep him honest. He's, Donovan's never going to come running after him out there, but if you hit one, he might get a little bit uncomfortable and come one further step. And then Jaden's so powerful and explosive. Maybe he can get by him once or twice. Now then well, that's, be- that's the thing, right? Like if you, if he hit like his little, uh, first of all, I have no idea how any of those shots go in because they are just <laughs> bullets right at the rim. It's just like somehow he finds a way to get them in. Um, but if you, if you knock down one or two, even if it's like 17 footers, right. And you're going to force Donovan to take that extra step. I think that's to me how you're going to be more likely to get him in foul trouble, right? Is to be able to hit him with like a pump fake and take that one dribble. Because the one thing about Klingon is, um, and he's gotten better at it lately, but he he will jump at pump fakes. He yeah. he will go after pump fakes, and I'm sure that they've all kind of seen that on film. I'm not really breaking any news to, um, <laughs> to anyone here, but like you can yeah. you can get him off his feet, and I think that that's that's probably to me. Uh, it's not just like burying him in the post and hoping to get him like reaching over to, to grab a foul. It's pull him away from the basket and make him try to guard in space a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's going to start start with Jaden being a face up guy. He'll have to get a couple duck ins and then just see if he can he can you know power him get get some leverage get down low and at least move him. It's funny seeing some of these pictures come up from last year. Is is Jaden's got the ball down low like this and then this monster of a person is up there. <laughs> and. Jaden's legs still look big and strong, but he does not look very big in that picture. And uh, there's a different one of him shooting a fadeaway and Klingon's contesting. And his it's kind of like those like old minute bowl pictures where his foot is barely off the ground and Jaden's like this far off the ground and he's still contesting at the top. So his length is out of this world. You've got to hit some jump shots. Um, you, you've got to come to play. I mean, it's simply put, you're, you're not going to back into beating them. You got to bring it. You got to take them out for what they're doing. They're so good. Their sets are good. You talked about having to blow up their sets. Um, I, I still, I can see my folder in my head right now. I mean, it had like 80 sets and you know how quick these turnarounds are. Whereas when we scouted for Bama, it was not 80 sets as you can imagine. Yeah. So, Well, that, I mean, that's the thing. It's like they run something and then they have a counter off of that. And then they have a counter off the counter. And then they have four different things that they're going to run out of the same alignment and you got to kind of figure out like what are they doing and then all of a sudden they'll hit you with the they're running this and then boom there's a back door and they got a wide open layup out of it because no one was expecting it and then they have like the tweak that they add for each of these specific i i don't i don't understand how the players on that roster can remember everything that they're supposed to run it just it's it seems mind-boggling to me no we agree and and as a defensive staff we know how much time we spend on defense so we're like they have to just do it all practice they have to because, of course, we designate time for offense, but we still do a ton of defense. And so 
for them to be so intricate and for that list to have been what it was with all of those calls, the only ones I remember thinking that we could decipher out were some of the Sonogo post touches last year, which mm-hmm. is where they get in a box and they do a diagonal to a cross screen. And it's like, you know, that sucker's going in there. And it, it's kind of like, you know, it's going to Jaden right now. It doesn't matter. Just get it to him and let, and let's play basketball from there. But the stuff with, with Spencer and Newton going side to side and, and all Spencer did was replace Hawkins. Like, Maybe he's not a top 10 pick, but he's producing the same. He's, he's a flamethrower and he can stretch the defense. So all of this stuff that looks the exact same, and then there's a slip. And then all of a sudden it's, no, it's an extra handoff to the lob. And it, they're really good at it. I had I had my respect skyrocketed uh, for Coach Hurley because all I knew is, is, is about him. I didn't know his, his mm-hmm. coaching. And man, when we dove into it, this that I have not seen a college offense like that. It, it was really, really cool to scout it. And and I, I mean, we hung in there. We cut it to five at the end last year. And then this year, I, I think they've shown that they're arguably better at times. Um, with, well, that's that was the next question I was going to ask you is, is from what you've seen with UConn this year versus uh, the amount of time you took preparing for them last year when they were playing their best, like where – how do you how do you kind of compare these two teams in terms of what they're running, what they do, and and I mean we could talk about who's better. I just you know right. both of them are really really good. Like you're kind of what do you like more, vanilla ice cream or mint chocolate chip? For sure. No, and even even last year with that little stretch kind of in January, if they don't lose those games where the you know I think there was an injury or two, and and then they just hit a skid for like three games. If that's not there, we're talking about them the exact same. They're going to have two or three losses mm-hmm. all year. And they were number one in the country, I think, or close to it. So I see them this year. I think they play a little bit because they were they were really getting that ball to Sonogo. And I don't think you throw it down there to Donovan quite as frequently. You know, you don't just want to, like, give it to him and play back to the basket. He gets plenty. But, I mean, our main goal was to not let Sonogo get the ball down there. He's an absolute monster. I mean, he looked like Jaden and was maybe even an mm-hmm. inch taller. And so that's not a normal college basketball player. Whereas when last year, when, when Donovan came in, we weren't like, keep it out of the post. Don't let him get it. Da, da, da. It wasn't talked about like that. So they did. I think they had a very deliberate idea last year. We got to let the beast eat down there and then let's get Hawkins on a double away. Let's, let's flip it back and let him circle around again and all those things. Whereas now I, I think that or one thing I did want to hit on is, is because of those threats with Hawkins and Sonogo and, and uh, Andre last year, Newton, believe me, he was high up on the board, but we were we were not hoping, obviously, that he was just going to get to cooking. And I think he had like 18 in the title game, and all that did was bleed into what he's done this year. He has not slowed down a bit. He's unbelievable. I mean, obviously, getting all American and all that stuff, but he, the way that he can carry him when he wants to, it is what all American guards do. You know, it's like, oh yeah, coach, I'll run the play for you. I'll run the play. Oh, we're down eight with. 10 to go watch this let me get four real quick and now it's a game you know you know he's just good enough to go and make plays whenever he wants to basically and he's bigger than you think i remember thinking that too he's, he's like six five like he doesn't look yeah. like it he doesn't really? carry himself like a six foot five 220 oh. pound point guard but he is oh he moves like he's six one six two he he's he's because lamont's like six two and and strong and he is bigger than lamont like like by far and so um they're good and i mean and Spencer's you know what it is with Tristan, like, and and Spencer falls into this category too. Like, neither of them look the part or move like they should be as good as they are. Like the thing with Tristan that always throws me off is he kind of dribble. He like he's got that high dribble and he plays kind of loose. And you just you watch him and he's getting pressure and like ah shit he's gonna lose this. Uh, th- this is gonna get taken from him. And then he just kind of is playing with it. And all of a sudden he crosses you up and he hits that little step back and it looks like the most unathletic three you've ever seen in your life. But he's banging twenty eight footers on you. And it's like right. where did that come from? And then you have Cam Spencer out here running around and looks like he's about he's less athletic than I am at 38 years old but all of a sudden like he just hits you with a jab step and then there's the pump fake and he's got that little reverse spin fade away it's like it's like who who are these guys did they just pick them out of the local YMCA and they're out here killing us right now but I think they're both gonna play in the NBA like they were damn good Uh, at the end of the day the ball goes in you know for both of them it just goes in and and yeah I mean Spencer reminds me of like Phil Forte and like those Oklahoma's like page and all these old Oklahoma state yeah. locals because he, like, they didn't look the part and the whole league hated guarding them because the ball is going to go in and and Newton his finishing package from about inside eight feet and not just the the Kyrie like finger rolls but all of those floaters he's got a master to where 
he can do it before the help comes. He can get your guy on the hip, use that size and just kind of let it go. Or like you said, a quick step back and the ball goes in. So, I mean, credit to him. I think you're in big trouble if he starts banging threes because he's, he's such a threat to just kind of pierce that arc and make plays for the guys. But I mean, I think, I think it's tough because even, even if you get uh, Donovan in foul trouble, they just, you know, bring in another big and and it's just, it's just tough at high major levels because there's just so much depth. They may not be the guy, they may not be the all American, but they could play like it one afternoon. They're chomping at the bit for their opportunity too. So. Yeah. The, uh, the one thing I would say is this particular matchup would not be the best for Samson Johnson's a backup five. And he's one of these like athletic movement bigs where they're going to use him to kind of blow up ball screens and, and, uh, hedge hard and, and try to um, take you out of what you want to do as opposed to clinging where they're just they're strictly playing drop and they're just saying all right yeah you know what if you want to take 12 foot jumpers over him good luck with that um, and Samson right. against Jaden Ledate like that's that is not the matchup that UConn wants it's it just I mean he's he's slender he's slim and uh, you got 24 year old Jaden Ledate that's the kind of matchup where he can just kind of back him down and, and go through yeah. him so um, that's why I think it's really important uh, in, in this particular game to keep clean out of foul trouble. Let me ask you this too. The other thing that teams have done all year long to kind of attack UConn has been uh, go at the four man, go at Alex Caravan because he is not the most uh, athletic kind of on ball defender. Uh, right. do, does does San Diego State have a dude like that? Is it Micah Parrish? Do they have someone that can try to take advantage of that, that matchup? If you're going small, it is. Um, but as, as you've seen the, as you dive back through this year, Elijah Saunders started all the first 10 or 11 games and Dutch doesn't change the starting lineup much at all. Um, It was his first time starting. I think he went through a learning curve. I know E very well. He's a competitor. He battled through it, but since he has started coming off the bench, he is banging threes. And so not that that's a direct attack on caravan, but our foreman is producing more. Whereas J pals, the energy guy, he's the, you know, the jumping bean, getting blocks all the time, getting offensive rebounds and tip outs. Um, and that's still not like a scout specific thing against his man. So mm-hmm. I think if you really want to actually attack him, it is Micah because Elijah's going to be pick and pop and he's a threat, but he's not a one-on-one guy where let me take advantage of his foot speed or anything like that. Um, and Caravan is, is, I would say stronger than people think as well. Like he holds his own on rebounding. He doesn't get punked anywhere. You're, you're only talking about athleticism and foot speed. You're not talking about production or, or, you know, battling or anything like that. He's proven himself a champion. Yeah. So tough as uh, hell too. Like he's, yeah. I mean, he's built here. I, I've seen the quotes. Hurley loves him. And he's just like, mm-hmm. I'm going to enjoy every day I have him. And that's that we all love that stuff. And so yeah. he, he's another I, one of these guys where like, he's got this one move where he catches it on the wing and he does like this elaborate jab step either way. And it's just, it's the goofiest looking thing, but it works every single time. And somehow he's able to get an angle and get to the rim and he'll dunk on you too. Like he's got like yeah. a seven, five wingspan. He can get yeah. up a little bit. And you're just like, this dude's dunking on me. What is going on right now? Oh, but I, I, back to Spencer, like, you know, you look at him and it's like, well, that, he doesn't look like Paul George, you know, but then he, he hits four threes in a row and the, and the lead stretches, you know, I mean, it's all about production with UConn mm-hmm. is they just produce, they all, they all deliver. And so um, Mike has got to play well. We can definitely play him at the four. One thing that I, I, I don't talk to the coaches like about the game plan anymore. I don't want to be that guy that's not in the room and banging their door down, but I, I would love to hear if there's any way you go miles Heidi at the five and try and get Jaden over to the four. Now, obviously, that could be as quick as is put Caravan over on Miles Heidi because you're not going to throw it to him all the time and let Donovan stay on Jaden. It can be that easy. But Heidi is seven foot and he does have touch. So maybe then you can go at Caravan a little bit different way. And and Dutch has played two bigs um, this year. I just don't know if this is the stage for it. Miles Heidi is going to be a very good young big. Um, it's it's crazy on his official. Is visit, he related to the kid from uh, for Purdue, Cam Heidi? No, no. His, both of his parents are, are are from the Northwest, and is it, they're enormous. His dad is seven one. His mom is six seven. His sister six six. And Miles is eighteen, and he's already seven foot. So he's not even done yet. His whole family <laughs> is big, and so he's he's. But I don't know if you, if it's the opportunity. You can feel him out. He's going to have to play some anyway. But I'd, I'd kind of like to see what UConn would do if they're both out there together because he is that big. I, I mean, Caravan's not going to have a. a walking to park by guarding a seven footer. And so uh, maybe, 
maybe you could get Jaden on on the caravan there, but I doubt it with the attention he's drawn this year. Even, yeah. even if it's a full blown front, and it's it's probably tough. So the only the only problem with that is then you have Jaden trying to chase caravan off of all these screens because you can't put Heidi on caravan defensively. You got to chase him off of all that movement, all those screens. And I promise you, if that was the lineup out there, it's like all right, caravan. Run off the uh, run off the all double the here, Caravan. Come off this pin now, Caravan. Do this, Caravan. Do that, and all of a sudden, oh, bangs the the on you. I'll change it. <laughs> We're not doing this anymore. Yeah, he's actually. I think that he is an X factor. Um, I don't know if it's particularly this game, but uh, he has not shot the ball at the same level that he shot it last year. Right? Yeah. If you look at kind of the 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 nights when he got it going in Big East play, it was against Georgetown and DePaul, and and he had like a month long stretch where if it wasn't Georgetown and DePaul, he was shooting like twenty three percent from three. But then he got um, hot in the Big East tournament, and uh, who did they beat in the semis? I think it was St. John's. I think he and he had a couple against Marquette too. So he's yeah. he's getting it going a little bit, but that's that's the one where. When he is making his threes, I just don't know how you stop him offensively. I was going to say, the coach in me doesn't believe that. I've seen him do it too much. Mm -hmm. I don't care. That's the same way everybody wants to talk about the, the Aztec guys right now. Like, oh, they, they can't shoot. I've seen them all make shots. Oh, that yeah. surprised me when they do that yesterday. I just get excited about it. I'm not like, what is happening? You know? So if Caravan comes out and goes three for three from three, I'll be the least surprised guy in the room because he's – I don't care about runs and all that. If he hits his first shot, we're in for a tough night. So Exactly. Um, there's a lot of weapons out there. It's going to be such a high level game. When I rewatched the one from last year, it's just, it's just juggernauts going at it. And I was, I was proud of us for cutting it to five there late. And then that Hawkins three was unbelievable. I was like, he looks like Devin Booker coming off the screen. Mm -hmm. So high, you know, he looked like a baby Ray Allen and I'm like, gosh, dang it. That's just what he does. So it is what it is, man. That will come back. Hopefully we can just keep it close. You know? Yeah. How do you, how do you, and this is off topic. Well, I got one more for you before I'll let you get out here. But um, how do you view that run last year? I talked with Lamont about this in the preseason. And um, on the one hand, you, you guys did something that was unprecedented at your university. Um, I think that making a final four is something where every school should hang a banner. And there's something you'd be proud of when it comes to making it to the national title game. And I'm also sure that you went into that national title game believing we can find a way to get this done. Like we can beat these guys and you didn't end up doing, reaching the ultimate goal. You know what I mean? So how do you, when you look back, how do you balance? We had did this unbelievable thing, but we didn't quite get to the mountaintop. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's multiple answers in there because um, I heard you guys talking about it yesterday about like even sweet 16 should be applauded and honored. Mm -hmm. And I was I was talking to some coaching buddies yesterday that are that are in it, and then a couple that are not, and they're like, yeah, but it's about the fan bases being unrealistic. They don't care if you make if you're even here. I'm in Fort Worth now. If you're in TCU and you make the tournament and lose, they don't care. Even though this is the first time ever they've made the tournament three times in a row, the fan base is going to be mad. Even though this is arguably the best run the Frogs have had lately, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's like we don't care. And so with us. We knew every time we chipped away closer and closer that we were making history. The guys are talking about Kawhi's years and all that. They were like, we're trying to be Kawhi. We're trying to be Kawhi because they made the Sweet 16. And then the thing that I heard the other day that kind of, because I have so many thoughts on it that put it over the top for me, is we still had that 1920 DNA in the room for that number one seed type team. Those, those were the seniors now. They knew what it was. They had that tournament taken away from them and and the heartbreak of the previous years to where we're up nine on Creighton in the first round and we give the lead up. And then and then prior to that, we're, we got Syracuse and we can shoot the ball. It's Terrell Gomez, Jordan Shackle, Matt Mitchell, the best three-point shooting team San Diego State's ever had. We didn't deliver that game. It had all built up from having a tournament taken, not hitting threes against Syracuse blowing the lead against Creighton up nine with two to go in uh, Dickey's arena. It all built up to like, this is it. It was on. And so when we beat Charleston, it was just like this year. You squeak by Charleston, blow out Furman, then they blew out Yale. And then here, I love telling this part of it is it was uh, Keyshawn Johnson, Nate Mensa, and Matt Bradley were standing at half court watching Alabama last year. And Brandon Miller, and Bidiaco, and, you know, Sears and, they're just, they sit there and looked at him and then they go, 
man, F them. And they ran into the locker room, like completely <laughs> pumped up. The intimidation factor was non-existent because they're like you're saying, even now they're different names, but they're old. So they're standing there watching Brandon Miller, the number one overall pick about to be probably. And they go, man, F them. They ran to the locker room jacked up. And I go, oh, hell yeah, we're about to win. <laughs> so you can't they can't take the heart of a champion, as cliche as that is. Like, they believe they're going to win. And they're not intimidated. They're not going to go out there and be like, oh, I kind of hope this goes well. Let's see how the first 10 minutes go. They're going to be about it. And there's we, we put on the locker room wh- whiteboard even, uh, no fake dudes. And, and they're not, you know, there's a reason why they produce. So, and then to answer the end of it about not, not finishing the job kind of, and getting that title is uh, it was more, it was such an interesting moment. Cause you, you don't ever expect to be in that room, you know, like that, unless you're you know, a blue blood and all that mess. But it was so interesting that the, the overwhelming emotion was still the exact same thing. It is, even if you don't even make the tournament is that it's done with this group. That was all anybody was talking about. It's like, man, we're done. We're done. Not, we didn't win the national championship. That came up, obviously, but it really was this circle. Our time just ran up. And and that was a really, obviously, cool moment, but a, a really powerful moment to where it was like, what these guys just did is unbelievable. It was almost taken for granted. Like, we know that. We know we've been making history. You know, we made history to get to the Final Four. We made history with the buzzer beater. Like, we're past the history part. It's that our our time just ran up. And so, really, really cool run. I mean, just there's there's few things that you'll ever describe it. It's been crazy feeling all that rush back this year and uh, and not want to be on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I know what it takes to be on that bench. I know what it takes to get on that plane and uh, in my life path just kind of swerved, but man, I'm glad I did it. And I think that's why I'm okay. Not being there is I got to do it. So. If uh, let's just say that San Diego state beats UConn and they beat the winner of Illinois, Iowa state. Are you, did you book that flight to Phoenix yeah. yet? Yeah, I'll be there. But <laughs> I, I was going to go to Boston. I, I've looked at those flights. I was going to fly straight up there. Uh, but my brother and his whole family are flying out from Atlanta this weekend. And I was like, I don't think that's a good look if they come out. <laughs> and I'll be like, hey, I'm at the garden in Boston. So yeah, my have- bad. But Phoenix, I'll be there. If they find a way. Leftovers are in the fridge, beers <laughs> in the garage. <laughs> you guys got it. All right. Yeah. This is what I want to end it with real quick. Um, if San Diego State is going to pull off this victory, what are the what has to happen? Like, how does how does that play out? I think regardless of how many, Jaden's got to hit some jumpers, just like he has been. That's not asking for a prayer. Just get to your elbow, back him up one time, hit a pull-up. Get a catch-and-shoot three off a pick-and-pop three. Kling it'll be deep. I'm sure they'll stunt from somewhere. Um, They may even X out and have somebody else guard him for a second, but he's got to hit a couple jumpers just to to keep him honest. You can't let him sink back even more and be big. Um, And then as a team, we've just got to hit some threes because they're, they're going to score the ball. You're, you're not going to shut them down completely. Um, and then it has been a, a theme all year is, is you just, I know we're going to defend. We got to rebound is you can't give them, can't give them multiple. Can't let cling and play tap, tap on the backboard as I call it. Um, and then I think you got a chance. If, if Jaden can get going early, like he has and get, and get the team feeling good to where there's no lid on it. And there's no thoughts of like, Oh hell, here we go. If he can get cooking, um and everybody else collectively hit some threes and and get you know one and done on the defensive end then it'll be it'll be a dog fight yeah you can't you absolutely cannot let uconn get up like 18 to 6 no like that no. against uh, northwestern like they're they run too much elaborate stuff they play too they're there's a as, as weird as it sounds there's a little bit of virginia like the 2019 virginia in their game in terms of how I long they're all over the guarding them. There's, there's a fake double away here. And so we call it mumbo jumbo and it's kind of fluff, but it's like you said, there's so many counters and intricate mm-hmm. little side deals with each one is that you don't know when it's mumbo jumbo. It just looks like it. So it'll be a flip. Let me just casually jog over here, double away. Let me casually jog over here, double away and then peel off and I'm getting one. And it's like, Oh dang, you know, like I'm not, I'm in this play. Whereas I've done this three times and he didn't do anything, but come over here to the corner. And now he just comes flying off a double. And so, or the, obviously when they slip and then they, they're so good at clearing out even strong side and getting clinging on an empty roll to where there is no tag. There's nobody to help. It's an empty side. So they, they hide it really well. 
everything looks the same entry. I think we'll defend them. Um, it's it's the same old thing with everybody. You just make them take tough ones. You know, if they make hard shots, that's okay. But that that's our DNA is tough twos. Yep. No no threes, no let no dunks and layups. It, you know, obviously it's going to happen at a high level. But just make everything tough twos, and then let's see how many they got. Yep. All right, JD. I appreciate the time, man. It's always a pleasure. Uh, which one of those shoes in the background is your favorite? Let's end on that. Oh man, there's. This one here in the middle is, uh, you can tell, is is wrapped in uh, cellophane. I got married in these, and I've never ah, worn them. So there you go. smart that man. Was, was a wedding. That was my only request of the wedding is, can I get married in the Concords? And that was all the way back in before they were retroing ten million pairs, and you went and got ice cream, and the guy next to me is wearing them because this is when they were actually special. But now they're everywhere, so they're fun. It's kind of like a big art wall. Yeah, the uh, the Elevens are absolutely my uh, my favorite Jordans. So. Yeah. I can't let it get diluted down. If they're good, they're good. The only problem with your setup right now is all your 11s are right there behind your head. Like you got to, you got to mix them up. So when you're sitting there on the video, no one can see you, man. That's the problem. I'm new to this. I got to figure out a setup. So <laughs> 90s, Listen, 90s basketball here. We'll, we'll get there. Let me figure yeah. it out. <laughs> Listen, man, I appreciate the time. It's great to catch up. And, uh, you know, I, I know we're both going to be locked in on Thursday night. Sure. Good luck to you guys. Appreciate you having me on.